it lies within them. How bad do you want it? Because these things, it's, it's tough. They're, it's competitive. Um, so to get a U.S. scholarship, what I was dealt, dealing with, it's competitive out there. To be a pro hockey player is extremely competitive. It's a worldwide market that, that teams and people are looking at. Um, so how competitive, how bad do you want it? Uh, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to put for? What kind of effort are you willing to put forth to try to achieve those things? And, and it's critical. It's critical that uh, the most successful ones or just the successful ones have that. They, they have that, uh, like I said, the intrinsic competitiveness, the fire inside to be the best they can be. And, uh, and hopefully they lean on people like me and you and other coaches and other resources to help them achieve that. You are listening to Brian Wiseman, the assistant coach of the Edmonton Oilers. And this is the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolin. Welcome to Up My Hockey with Jason Padolin, where we deconstruct the NHL journey, discuss what it takes to make it, and have a few laughs along the way. I'm your host, Jason Padolin, a 31st overall draft pick who played 41 NHL games but thought he was destined for a thousand. Learn from my story and those of my guests. This is a hockey podcast about reaching your potential. Hey there, hi there. Welcome back to the Up My Hockey podcast with Jason Padolin. This is episode 76, and today we are going to be chatting with Brian Wiseman. Brian Wiseman um, is a name you may know, you may not know. Uh, he was a very decorated player uh, back in the 90s, uh, more in the minor leagues than the NHL. He only played three games in the NHL with the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, but he did come out of Michigan, University of Michigan, where uh, he was a heck of a hockey player there for the four years he stayed. And then he was a prolific scorer um, in the minor leagues, in both the AHL and the IHL, where he ended up winning a scoring title and an MVP award in the IHL uh, the year his Houston Arrows, led by Dave Tippett, uh, won the uh, Turner Cup championship. So Brian had a very great career in his own. Uh, he did follow uh, Dave Tippett to the Edmonton Oilers, where he is now the assistant coach, uh, working with the forwards, uh, also uh, responsible for face-offs, and is also responsible for the development of some of the younger players on the team. So absolute pleasure to have Brian on. Uh, Brian was a line mate of mine for the playoffs uh, the year I got traded to Toronto. Uh, so I got to Toronto, things didn't go quite as awesomely as I would have liked with the big club. So when we were out of the playoffs with the Maple Leafs, they asked me to go down, I shouldn't say asked, they told me to go down to uh, St. John's and play with the Baby Leafs there for the uh, Calder Cup playoffs. And uh, I was fortunate enough to be placed on a, on a line with Brian. Uh, Wisey is a heck of a player, as I said earlier. Uh, great vision on the ice, really understood the game, high hockey IQ, and loved to distribute the puck. So uh, as a shooter, uh, it was a real lot of fun to play with him. Unfortunately, Wisey got a real bad concussion that year in the playoffs and was forced uh, to miss uh, the, the second half of the playoffs, which definitely hurt our chances. We ended up losing to Hamilton in seven games that year. Um, but yeah, this is a great conversation with, with Brian. Anytime you have a chance to talk with somebody, uh, well, from the NHL, one, uh, but from, from the NHL on a team that has arguably the two best hockey players in the world on it, uh, how can you not be excited about a conversation like that? Uh, so definitely talk some Connor McDavid. We definitely talk some Leon Dreisaitl. We talk about um, you know some of my favorite topics like culture, like intangibles, uh, like self-assessment, uh, preparedness, uh, some amazingly common themes that these coaches want to discuss and look forward to discussing because it really speaks to how to be great. And you know that this is the whole focus of this is like, how do you be your best as a hockey player? How do you be your best as a coach? How do you get to the places you want to get to and reach the goals that you want to achieve? And uh, you can pick up something from every one of these podcast episodes. And this is no, uh, this is not a stranger to that because Brian drops a lot of uh, truth bombs here. He drops a lot of insights and a lot of gems along the way. So I think you're going to really enjoy this hour conversation um, with Brian Wiseman. So let's listen to the conversation with assistant coach of the Edmonton Oilers, Brian Wiseman. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, well, here we are. I do the intro prior, YZ, but we have on the assistant coach of the Edmonton Oilers, Brian Wiseman, and a long, long, many moons ago was a center, uh, my center for a, for a brief moment in time for the St. John's Leafs. Um, so welcome to the podcast, uh, YZ. No, thanks for having me, Jace. That's good. It's uh, it's great to reconnect with you after so many years. No kidding, right? My goodness, we've had a we've had a common denominator there in uh, in Dave Oliver. So I know um, he was also a line mate of yours. Um, yeah, maybe a little more successful line mate. You guys won a championship together, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know he's kind of keep me kept me in the loop with, with with you and what you've been up to, and uh, and obviously got us connected for for this interview. So uh, great to see both you guys doing so well in in, in the NHL. I wanted to ask you a little bit just about your own career because we we met there when you were when you were in St. John's. You were in St. John's for one year. Um, ended up being hurt, I think, that playoffs. If I'm if I if I'm correct, and I think that was kind of our did. demise. Didn't you went down with an in, with a concussion? Didn't you? Yeah, I, I I didn't make it through the playoff uh, series there. Maybe our semifinal, whatever it was, uh, with concussions, and that kind of lingered on the next year, which ultimately probably. Uh, was the end of my career, you know, just not recovering from, you know, those, those types of injuries, uh, become more common the following year. I know. Right. What would you like looking back on that now? Um, and what we all know now, like we don't know what we don't know at the time. Uh, did you, did you have symptoms and kept playing? Like, did you come back too early or what would you have done different? Um, not the year that you and I played together necessarily. Um, because they helped me out the rest of the playoffs after I got knocked out pretty good in, in the one series. Um, the following year, definitely, uh, I, I was, you know, feeling some things and, uh, I ignored them. Uh, I didn't report them, um, for a number of reasons. Uh, I, I'm a competitor. I wanted to play hockey. Uh, I was chosen, you know, as a, as a leader on the team and I wanted to lead. Um, and so I wanted to be a part of it. And, uh, looking back, you know, that was, a, that was the wrong decision because I certainly needed, uh, more time to heal as, uh, some of these injuries kept reoccurring. It's the toughest thing as an athlete, isn't it? And I think, I don't know how you feel about it, for, but for me, I think the protocols now and not allowing the athlete really to be involved in the decision at all is is the best way to do it. Because, you know, back when we were, when I, when I was doing it, when you were doing it, it was like, do you have a headache? And you would answer yes or no, or whatever the case may be. And and you could answer that however you wanted to, because with these concussions, you never know. There was no baseline test. There was no nothing else, right? And you wanted to be in the lineup. You're protecting the job. Uh, you wanted to play your competitor, and so you you did whatever you thought was best. No one's looking to the future, but now with taking it out of the athlete's hands, I think that's probably best for everyone, don't you think? I think it is. I, I think yeah, obviously the, the the research and the information that uh, that is out there now that all our medical trainers and doctors have um, it should it should lie within them. Um, obviously, there's some communication with the athlete and the doctors and the trainers, um, but I think in the end the the information that's been collected over years uh the the protocols in place um i think have to be respected yeah yeah and uh game's definitely different that's for sure but you had a hell of a career i definitely want i mean i want to talk about connor and ask you questions about leon and i mean obviously what you're doing right now but uh i don't want to disregard an amazing career in and of your own right um you're a hell of a player uh, let's start back at University of uh, Michigan there. Um, is For those of you who don't know, YZ was an undersized forward at the time, and maybe that's a nice way to put it, a, a short forward, um, you know, five foot seven or five foot eight. I'm not sure exactly how, how tall you were, but yeah. um, uh, but a hell of a playmaker and a hell of a player, just not a large player. And it was, a, it was at a time where everyone wanted big. So was that kind of part of your decision to go to the college route at that point, or did OHL was ever that a part of your discussion? Yeah, not not a whole lot. Like certainly, um, I, I had I had a value placed on education, and and the easiest way at that time was to go the U.S. college route, as far as the you know if you could attain a scholarship, right? And so I had some opportunities in the OHL. Was drafted there, um, and I guess courted there. Uh, but in my mind, I, I didn't foresee me having this long drawn out professional hockey career just with who I was as a hockey player or I thought the state of the game and so I thought the best avenue for me would be to go to the U.S. and, and get a degree get an education and play in and try to you know maximize the hockey part of it um, and I did that in some degree yeah darn straight you did you guys had great teams there and you were you were 
productive from the moment you walked in to the to university there and i think that's where you and ollie first started playing together if i'm not correct right we we did we came in the same year we were we were roommates and classmates and uh and right from the get-go essentially probably line mates for the majority of our four years um so uh i was been fortunate to play with a lot of good players jay says as you that one year in in, in st john's and, and amongst others in my professional career but but Ollie specifically in college, uh, we had a connection. We had a, a real uh, sense of where each other is on the ice and what each other each other are going to do. Um, so we had a real strong connection that lasted for a long time in many games and, and lots of great victories. Yeah, you did, and you won. Uh, you won a championship there in the eye together. I believe he came back that last season, right, and helped helped you guys win. And that was uh, the year you won the MVP in the IHL that year. We did it. We had a great year. It was in Houston. We had another teammate of ours, Cam Stewart, uh, who was reunited, a, a college teammate that was reunited with the three of us. And uh, we had a tremendous team in Houston, led by Dave Tippett, who's the head coach here in Edmonton. Um, but our team was, as you know, um, the successful teams and the championship teams, there's always a degree, potentially one or two degrees of what makes that team get to the top. Uh we certainly had talent. We had a coach. We had talent. We had multiple players at positions that that were really, really good and effective. But we were a close team. We 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 were a band of brothers. We uh, we stuck together on and off the ice, and I, I really think that put it that took us through some hard times, um, and and really made a long season so enjoyable. We enjoyed being around the rink uh, with each other. We enjoyed being on the road with each other. We enjoyed working hard for one another. Uh, we kept each other kind of accountable at different situations of the year. Uh, it was a special group, and, and it, we were fortunate that we were able to, to end it in the right way with the win. Yeah, I don't think it matters what league you're in. I mean, the story the story about championship successes, and, and sometimes even the bridesmaid, to be honest, you know, to get to get to the final and to get there, I mean, things got to go right, and maybe it always doesn't go your way right to the end, but generally the, the, uh, the theme is the same, and there's a togetherness and there's a family uh, – kind of camaraderie uh, uh, feeling to it and we've I've had that discussion on this podcast before and it's like you know which is which boils down to a cult the word c called the culture word right that everyone's trying to find and what what that means and what it is and and one of the elements seems to be a togetherness uh in your level at the national now with the way the game is and with COVID and with what all these things that are happening and the social habits of players that are different than when we were around like how how does that unity happen away from the rink? Does it, or 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 is there just a different way to do it? No, it certainly does, uh, without question. Uh, and I, I believe we have a, a a unique group here in Edmonton, a fairly young group for the most part, um, but a group that's been the core group has been along around together for an awful long time, um, and certainly some special players in that group. Uh, you know, our, our coach Dave Tippett here. Uh, has a great feel for uh, what our team needs uh, to pull back to push in different situations. I think our players respect that and respond to that. Um, so it's an all encompassing uh, answer. I think that, yeah, the, the, you have to have the right people in the locker room uh, that uh, that are motivated uh, for a common goal and you need, you need the proper leadership. And, and we certainly have the proper leadership here in Edmonton. With with today's and this is just me being a player and a, and a more a question from a player perspective. I remember like the road trips were fun back in the day because that was when you know you have your single guys and your young guys that are doing whatever they do at home, and the and the family guys are family guys, and you go on the road and everyone's got to go to dinner or everyone's got to go to lunch. So like everyone kind of that was more the place to bond. Uh, in this day and age with with cell phones and the you know how famous really everyone is. Uh, is that can you go out for just beers anymore? Like do guys do that or, or what does that look like? Yeah, it's it certainly uh, is different, uh, the landscape in, in, in terms of what you described. Um, I'm sure our guys still get together, uh, enjoy each other's company uh, in different settings. Um, but you're right. It, it's uh, that's part of, you know, the camaraderie of of some of the great memories that we all have when we played. Right. Uh, those times together bonding, you know, at a restaurant on the road. Uh, after games in the locker room or wherever that may take you. So uh, they just, I think there's just uh, a little different awareness of it now uh, yeah. in today, in today's 
era. Um, but nevertheless, it, it's important that uh, the guys respect each other, get along with each other, uh, and, and work hard for one another. Yeah, for sure. You mentioned uh, you mentioned you got a special group there. Um, I want to talk about Tip though for a little bit, and even like back back to you because you guys, you know, you and Ollie, there's a history there, and, and I'm all about relationships because I think that was one thing. Not that I missed, I didn't miss it because I was really. I felt that was really important, especially with my teammates. But the relationship between players and coaches, sometimes I didn't do a great job with, um, meaning trying to cultivate it or understand what they wanted from me or whatever the case may be, right? Um, you won a championship with Dave Tippett. Um, and I know Tipp and Ollie are still are still close, you know, and I think that happens again. Like we talk about families, we talk about championship teams, we talk about, you know, going to war for each other. There's, there's a respect and a trust factor there. Uh, is that how, because I know when Tip came to Edmonton, like that's where you came, you left Michigan, you came with him. Was that part of like your guys' history and you ending up in Edmonton? No question, certainly. It was, it was, it, it took us back to our time and our relationship that was built uh, in Houston back in the late 90s. Uh, I played for Tip for two years. Um, so it started there. Uh, a number of years later, I, I joined his staff in Dallas uh, once my playing career was done as a video uh, coach. Um, back in maybe 2002, I think it was. Uh, and then we kept in touch throughout. Uh, lots of, you know, visits. And uh, especially when I was a college coach at Michigan, I'd go to his training camps when he was in Arizona and, and different things. But and we connected many times through uh, through the hockey season in the off season. And uh, that's part of what you talked about that special year in Houston and, and the culture that, that he formed there. Um, there was respect for our coach and there was a uh, mutual respect from coach to player and uh, strong relationships and st strong bonds that were developed there that still are maintained now. And it would go across lots of coaches from lots of uh, players from that team are in coaching now. And uh, probably a lot of us uh, respected the heck out of Dave Tippett and uh, thought that would be uh, maybe a future career path for, for us uh, after having a couple of years with him. Take a short break here, as always, just to say thank you to you, the listener, you who choose to download and to and to watch and to comment. Uh, love everyone who is a fan of this podcast. I really appreciate your support uh, as it allows me to keep doing what I'm doing because it motivates me to keep doing what I'm doing. I, of course, love the conversations myself. Uh, I really do get inspired by having the conversations with these players, but listening to the impact uh, that it has on, on the conversations and the car rides that it allows uh, moms and players to have and dads and players to have um, to, to have discussions around dining room tables about how some of this stuff applies to you as an athlete and to your family. Uh, it really motivates me to, uh, to keep pushing out the episode. So thanks so much for doing what you do. As always, I appreciate any review uh, that you may give, any shout out on social media. Um, anytime you talk about it with one of your friends or one of your uh, family members, uh, I do appreciate it as, as that is the best way to spread this podcast and get it into more, more people's uh, audio devices. So thank you again. Uh, keep the reviews coming. And now back to the episode with Brian Wiseman. What a great, uh, you know, compliment really at the end of the day, right? Like that, you know, a, a coaching position, which you're in now, it can be, it really can be inspiring, right? Not only to the group that's playing for them, but even like from a mentorship role of like, geez, this might be something that I want to do. I want to be a leader of, a leader of men in some capacity, right? Um, when when Dave called you there, like, did you know as a player, like, was that, did you have your eye on that uh, at the time? Like, this might be something that I would want to be on a bench one day? I think so. I think it was always in the back of my mind, even uh, going through college. I went through it. I got a degree with, in education. Uh, so I thought during the time, if there, I stayed in hockey, maybe coaching would be a platform for me, for me to use that degree, that degree the teacher's degree. Um, and as I made my way through hockey, that... Uh, I tried to take notice of different styles and different uh, approaches some different coaches had with the way their teams played or or specifically how coaches coach my team. Uh, for example, our, our coach out in, in St. John's, Mark Hunter. Um, I love Mark Hunter. He, I thought he was a tremendous coach, he, much different than Dave Tippett, but both very successful in their ways. And so you take a little bit from all the people that uh, you've been exposed to uh, in a round uh, and try to formulate maybe a, a little bit of who you are uh, and what you want to be as a coach. And so I've been fortunate around 
tremendous uh, mentors of mine that have been in hockey uh, that I've taken a whole lot from. Uh, but it, it, it's uh, it's a it's a great profession. It's it's to, to be able to stay in the game uh, has been certainly blessed blessed me. Um, it's it's allowed me to have different uh, different places and stops along the way from playing now to coaching, uh, family situation, uh, some different cities we lived in and, and moved moved to and from. So it's provided me a tremendous life. Yeah, yeah, hockey's a great. Hockey is a great vehicle for that. You meet a lot of great people and uh, it's great 100%. to be able to evolve even like yourself. You're talking about as a person, essentially, right? Within the game for, from different aspects, being being a player and growing into the in the leadership of, of, of leading a team and, and, and learning from others in, in a different way, right? Yeah, as players, we are trying to pick up things from each other and, and learn from each other. And, and now you're in the coaching aspect doing that as well. Um, yeah, never heard a bad thing about Dave Tippett from anyone. You know, it's one of those people that, uh, you know, anyone who seems to have crossed his path uh, always has a genuinely positive experience with him, uh, which, you know, when you're dealing with 20 players on a team or 24 in, in your scenario, you know how hard that is to do, right? Somebody's usually mad at the end of the day, but it uh, seems like Dave is, you know, his, or Tip has been able to, I, I would probably guess integrity is the strongest word, right? If, if you're if you're keeping things above board and if you're honest and if you're sincere and, and your integrity is there, there's really not much to be to be mad at, at the end of the day if, as a player. No, that's that's the word you hit it on. You hit it right on the head, Jace. Uh, everything he does is with integrity, uh, with purpose, uh, mindful of, you know, the impact it may have of the team or, or, or individuals. Um, the one thing I always say, you know, when pe people ask me about Dave is, uh, everything he does is without ego. Uh, and so you get, you get exactly who he is and why he makes decisions and, and the calls he makes is, is all about the betterment of the group and, and nothing to do with him. And, uh, sometimes that's, uh, not always the case Yeah, with, with, you know, in, that, in right? situations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing that that has come up before, and I've noticed sometimes, I don't think it's a it's a true parallel all the time, but that the team can sometimes take pieces of that coach's personality. You know, like the the energy that the coach has. Sometimes, like a, a team will inherit that. Um, with this current group, what what do you? Is there any traits that you think the team is is picking up of uh, from Tip? Yeah, it's uh, we've have a, a few new pieces this year that we'll see, we're only twenty games in, so we'll see how it all develops. Uh, but one that I think that would stick out to me is uh, the calmness he has, um, the, the preparedness that he has going into every game uh, certainly has an effect on our group and uh, the way they probably feel confident going into games that we are prepared uh, for our opponents. Uh, we understand what our game should be and what it should look like and some different, uh, you know, modifications we make to it from, you know, time to time. Uh, there, there's a I think there's a strong understanding of of that from our group, and uh, and that comes from certainly from our head coach. It's a great answer, and you hit you hit a point. I mean, I don't know. You probably don't know exactly what I'm doing now, but I'm helping teams and and players really be, be their best in whatever capacity that might be. And and sometimes it, it's it's the stuff away from the rink that actually helps you be better at the rink. Um, and I've noticed that in this day and age, that it's it's really like you're, you're looking for percentages right like percentage changes can make can make big changes and you mentioned the word preparedness and and how that's connected to confidence could you maybe like just for some of the younger players that are listening like that's one of the things that i preach is like when you are prepared you feel you feel more confident everyone like that c word of confidence everyone wants confidence confidence and and i believe preparation is one of the ways to to get it to manufacture it um can you talk about that maybe as a player or now as a coach what what that means being prepared yep no question I think I think it, it's a uh, it's a critical part of uh, success uh, in anything we do. The discipline to do that, uh, to be prepared, to understand what prepared being prepared is, um, and what that can then develop. You mentioned confidence. I wholeheartedly believe that's without doubt uh, one of the major attributes of, of people. Someone being able to develop confidence is is understanding that the work they put in. The, the preparation they've put in, the focus and attention uh, they've put forth, um, they understand. Then, then you, you, have a, you have a sense of confidence going into different situations. Uh, so as a player, I tried to uh, be prepared as I could to understand the type of game I needed to play. Uh, 
at different situations or different opponents um, uh, where my game needs to grow. Uh, uh, so I think self-assessment is a big part of, mm. of that as well uh, in the reflecting of, of one, you know, where your game's at and some different things that you could uh, change and, and alter along the way to, to, for improvement. And that's part of the preparation, I think, as well. Uh, just the self recognition, but but to your point of the direct re- link between being prepared and the confidence that can can grow from that, uh, I certainly believe in. And uh, we talk about being prepared. You know, often at, in college, we we did it a lot. Uh, when I was assistant university admission, our head coach certainly talked about being prepared uh, because of the many things that you had in your life, whether it was the social aspect, the the educational part, the, you know, the downtime, the different stresses, the different people, not the right people, the different things that pull, may pull you in some different directions and, and understanding uh, how to balance all that out, how to manage all that. And then how to, uh, when we're at the rink, be focused and, 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 and present uh, during that time. Um, I know it's a long winded answer, but I, I, I do agree that, uh, being prepared can can go in a bunch of different areas uh, in in one's life and the discipline with with sticking to that. Um, and I certainly could confidence can grow from that. Yeah, I uh, and it, listen, to you talk there and, I, and maybe that that is what you do now. Uh, actually, maybe we'll get into that next, maybe like your, your role as the assistant coach and, and you know, how you facilitate success uh, among amongst your group. Uh, but I imagine that part of it is understanding the personalities that you're dealing with. And I think, I don't think, I know, I know that maybe some coaches that were ahead of their time back when we played were, were attuned to that, you know, but it was a very one voice fits all approach at most places that we played. And I think that there's an understanding now that we can't treat everybody the same because everybody is different. And we talk about preparation like you just said there, um, not everybody's going to be Rob Brindamore or Sidney Crosby or whoever, right? Like we might have this idea of this model of uh, example model of like how to be a pro, but not everybody can fit into that mold to be their best is what I mean by that, right? Like some yeah. guys are at the gym all day or at the rink all day. They're just going to be burnt out and they're not going to be great. Um, so being consciously competent is one is one term that I like to use is like having that self-assessment that, 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 you, uh, that term you said there of knowing how do I be great? How am I my best and how do I help this team be successful uh, at your level? Have most guys figured it out, do you think? Or is guys still trying to figure out where where that lies for them? Yeah, I think it. I think it's a moving target, you know, especially as young guys trying to establish themselves uh, in pro hockey or, or at every level um, to develop that. But part of it, is, you know, like you said, was that as you prepare and go along things may change and 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 one shoe is doesn't fit all one approach does not uh fit everybody or work for everybody and to understand that as an individual what you need as an athlete um may be much different than the guy sitting next to you in the locker room and that's all right that has that is okay as long as you are working towards that um, and it, it, it's, you might have some crossover things that, that parallel and, and they go well together uh, with somebody else and different things. But the bottom line is, is the, I believe, is the intrinsic competitiveness in oneself to be the best they can. And then there's, uh, then there's tools and resources out there to help you accomplish yeah. that, right? No, I love um, that answer. Someone like, love yourself, that answer. like someone like yourself of what you provide to some of these young athletes. Like, uh, so to understand yourself, to understand what you need uh, to continue to evolve and improve uh, might be much different than somebody else, but you have a, you have a real understanding of you uh, and maybe your needs and then reaching out to the resources and an assistant coach is a resource. Yeah. A trainer is a resource, a sports, you know, medical professional sports psychologist is a resource the the strength guy is a resource the nutritionist is a re- there's lots of the video that is available to us now is resources the internet are resources people like you so uh understand what what you what is available and what may help you uh i think is part of it and i think that's ever evolving yeah 
Yeah, and I want to under, underline that for everyone listening and, and just put my own spin on it. Because you, you said, like, as long as they're working towards something. And I think that, that's the thing. Like, doing nothing and just showing up, right, and waiting for the coach to tell you to do something and then going home and they stop telling you to do something, like, that's not being actively involved, not only in your development, but in your success or in your team's success, right? So how you fit into that and how you continue to grow as an athlete, whether you're at the pro level or at the junior level or at the minor hockey level, I think that accountability on that on that player, the sooner they understand that and really dive into, hey, how how do I fit into this ecosystem and, and how am I gonna how am I gonna benefit from where, where I'm at? That's on the athlete. I mean, you like I said, you're definitely there. I well, I shouldn't say what you do, but I know you're there for support. You have to be, right? But you can't go out and, and be br- building bridges all over the place to all these guys to make sure they come to you, right? Like there's gotta be some. There's got to be some um, accountability to the player to, to say, hey, why is he, man? Like, what do you see? Like, what can we do here after practice or whatever the case may be? 100%. And, and, and that's part of our role as assistant coach. Certainly my role is to uh, to ask those questions of the guys, to, to, to develop a bond and a trust uh, in my brief two and a half years here um, for those situations. That, that We're here to make them better. We're here to help them uh, have success. Um, and whatever success means to that individual uh, in the big picture of our team success, obviously. Um, but even take it back even younger when I was working in college and, and I was talking to young kids and junior hockey players or, or youth hockey players, and they aspired to go to college. Or they aspired to be pro hockey players. Just like, you, you know, just to echo what you said, it lies within them. How bad do you want it? Because these things, it's, it's tough. It's competitive. Um, so to get a U.S. scholarship, what I was de- dealing with, it's competitive out there. To be a pro hockey player is extremely competitive. It's a worldwide market that that teams and people are looking at. Um, so how competitive, how bad do you want it? Uh, what are you willing to sacrifice? What are you willing to put for? What kind of effort are you willing to put forth to try to achieve those things? Mm-hmm. And, and it's critical. It's critical that uh, the most successful ones or just the successful ones have that. They, they have that, uh, like I said, the intrinsic competitiveness, the fire inside to be the best they can be. And, uh, and hopefully they lean on people like me and you and other coaches and other resources to help them achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's uh I mean, the hard work it kind of, it, it almost goes without saying anymore. I mean, you have to work hard. The funnel's too tight not to work. Like you have to work, but it's like, where can you, where else can you get that edge? And I think your, your intention or your deliberateness or whatever word you want to use with that, you know, like to, how does this, how does this even like break it down to a drill? How does this drill apply to me? And, and how can I, how can I get better within the confines of this drill? Like, I think when, when, when athletes start getting like that, I, that's kind of my definition of professionalism. Like when they, when that is, it was, when that's the undercurrent of what of what's going on and which brings me to the point of like me hearing about connor mcdavid working on his one time i actually use that as an example with this junior team that i'm working great team bunch of great kids um doing a good job and being successful but not maybe seeing like the attention to individual development that could be there right like you know you know exactly what i'm talking yeah, about right 100%. doing it but not really doing it and uh and I don't know Connor McDavid and I don't know how true that story is, but like to hearing that the best player in the world needs to improve his one timer, like it's kind of laughable. I mean, to some people, right. That, that he, that he would be out there banging one timers. Right. But like, if that is true, like, my God, what an example, right. He is legitimately probably one of the best players to ever wear skates. And he thinks he needs to improve his, his shot. Right. Uh, what does that say to the 17 year old, the junior who, who, you know, wants to go play for a D one school. Like you should probably be working on something right now. <laughs> right. It, and it is true. Just to just to make that clear. Um, and that's not the only thing he works at. He, he comes to work every day. He, he, and he's extremely competitive, highly motivated. Um, but yeah, you'll see him out with our goalie coach before practice because the goalie has got a drill of, you know, East West scene plays on, you know, simulating a power play. And it's one timers, maybe a team that we may be facing. Connor's out there hitting one timers because that's an area of focus that he would like to see his, his game improve. Uh, a year ago, take it after my first year here, so two seasons ago, um, he goes in the off season and hires a face-off uh, instructor to 
go over every single one of his faceoffs through the year and put put time in in the summer to be a better faceoff man. Um, we're in, he's seeing results from that. And that's part of one of my duties here is his face-offs here within our structure here in our, our coaching staff. Um, so there's the best in the world who just came off an MVP year that year, I believe, looking at areas of his game that he can improve on, that he could expand his game, that he could be uh, more dominant in. And uh, it's impressive. Just take another short break here with my conversation with Brian to remind you that there are ways to follow me. Uh, this episode that you are listening to now on whatever device, maybe you are watching it on YouTube, but the episode is available on YouTube. So uh, I do have a podcast channel there, Up My Hockey with Jason Padol. Not only does it have my podcast episodes, it also has the hot uh, the podcast highlights. There's also uh, lessons from the pros, which are video clips uh, that uh, that apply to how to be your best. Uh, there is also um, some tidbits from me and uh, some of the mindset coaching that I do. So if you want to follow me on YouTube, you can definitely do that and watch this episode. Uh, you can also uh, join my parent group if you are a hockey parent on Up My Hockey uh, on Facebook. There are currently over 1,500 families from across North America that are part of the community. It is an amazingly supportive community. Uh, we talk about the good, we talk about the bad, but all in a supportive approach. And, uh, and we just help navigate the space of what is amateur hockey and trying to make dreams come true and get to junior teams and get to universities and get scholarships and, and uh, you know, for some, make to the NHL. So that's what that group is all about. Um, in this episode of this podcast, you will hear that there are questions uh, being asked to Brian Wiseman from that group. So I often, I often pull the group, um, get them to ask questions, uh, questions they might would ask if they were in front of my guests. And sometimes I do ask questions. So today you're going to hear from some of the members of the group. Um, I'm also on Instagram at Jason Padolan. So there's three great ways to follow me. Also the website upmyhockey.com. So uh, lots of ways to follow me on social and different ways to consume the content you are hearing there are hearing now. So now back to the episode with Brian Wiseman. Yeah, I mean, what an example. I mean, for everyone else. I mean, how, how does, you know, I, I won't throw names, but how does, you know, how does whoever on, on the Edmonton Oilers feel like they can't be working on something when they're seeing, when they're seeing the guy with the C on who, who's, who's obviously a, an, an elite, an elite player uh, doing this extra stuff that has to help the team culture. Definitely. It, it, you know, as you know, it's, uh, uh, it's it's contagious some of that those behaviors within a, a team structure right uh if your best players are working the hardest um usually good things happen and he, he's obviously uh one of the best players uh in the game if not the world um and there's probably not one that works harder uh at his game that's impressive so i mean that is you I mean you talk to enough coaches and and that really is seems to be one of the underlying themes of them to be successful is if my best players are my hardest workers or my best example of the things that I want this team to encompass, we're going to be okay. You know, like when, when the top guys, they get way too much rope and they can play the game a different way yet you're trying to manage, you know, the bottom six and have them do these things. Like it becomes pretty hard, right. For everyone to believe in a system. Um, so to, you think, you think with, with Connor and, um, I don't want Leon's a little bit different of a player. He seems his personality is a little different too. It, it, can, does that, do, do those guys kind of operate the same way or are they different when it comes to their approach to the game? No, their approach is very similar. They're extremely competitive and they're hardworking at their craft. They want to be the best that they, they, they can certainly be. Uh, they push each other uh, internally within our team. Uh, others like Darnell nurse is a tremendous worker. Uh, you know, sets a great example for our young players and specifically our young defense uh, and there's others, you know, Duncan Keith comes in this year as a veteran defenseman, you know, uh, Stanley Cup champion, uh, you know, potential Hall of Famer. Like uh, the experience he can impose on our locker room of the things that he's been through. So um, to your point, originally of, yeah, in a perfect world, your, your best players, if they're your hard work, hardest workers, um, it's probably easier to get the group together and, and hurt them in the right direction. Right. Um, and it's usually self done, um, within the locker. 
kind of self-controlled, right? Yeah. Um, if it's not, then it's more challenging. And that's where uh, really effective coaches can come in and, and certainly make a difference uh, in, in some different situations like that. Since Ron Connor, I, I had to ask because it was uh, it was all the buzz of social media there a week, and I know that the way social media works now, it's a story one day and it's gone the next, so it's about six days old now, and maybe you've already talked about it. But uh, Tortorella and his soundbite with, um, and I I personally think it was a little bit misconstrued. I, I think it got blown up a little bit, but he said that Connor needs to change his game in the playoffs, and I probably even paraphrased that wrong because it um, it's picking on Torts, but. Um, I think he maybe had a bit of a point there, but what is your thoughts on, on that comment and, and how did you digest that? And, and, and was it water off a duck's back for Connor? Does it, you know, how, how did that impact anything? Yeah, I, I didn't, I didn't hear uh, John speak directly to that. Obviously I heard some people paraphrasing some just talking amongst here. Um, I couldn't tell you if it affected Connor one way or the other, um, but I can tell you um from my experience with Connor McDavid, uh, he cares. He cares an awful lot about winning. He's motivated and driven to be a winner, uh, not just be an individual great player. He wants to be a champion. Uh, he wants to win this cup. Uh, and so the motivation, the commitment for him and his focus of doing that um, certainly uh, is there and it evident in every day, just about every time he takes the ice. And so uh, I believe you can win with people like that. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, I've seen his game evolve and obviously you have in the last two and a half years too. I mean, it, uh, he's, 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 he's the most dynamic player there is in the league. I mean, for one, we all see the highlight reel goals, but I like watching the nuances and the intangibles and the smaller, the small area stuff that he's doing. He seems, he seems to be much more engaged in his own end. Um, he's on the defense of the puck defensive side of the puck more than I've seen him in the past. Um, he's battling a little harder in those areas, I think. Um, so I don't know. I mean, to me, that's maybe what Torch, maybe was Torch was saying, maybe not. Like in maybe in years past, it was kind of more of too much of an offensive focus. But like I see, I see a really complete player in Connor McDavid now. And I think, I think that's a testament to what you're saying there, that he wants to win. He certainly does. And you're, and you're, and you're bang on. Um, and as we know, uh, majority of all championship teams across all sports uh can't rely on one individual or two individuals it's got to be a collective effort uh he leads the charge for our team and lots of guys uh are on board uh no question you've seen that evolve from the time that i've been here certainly in um in the success of this season uh, which you guys are definitely having and your team looks your team looks as solid as it's been as far as being ready to win in my opinion uh some of the changes there that Kenny did over the over the uh, over the off season uh, seems like you have more depth than than you've had before. You I mean talking about Connor and Leon to support those guys to allow teams to worry about other things other than just those two. Uh, is there who's the glue guy in the room now? You know, everyone wants to talk about Connor or Leon or you know some of the stars. Who, who's that guy in that locker room that's maybe been an addition or stepped up into the role that just is is a is a real big piece of that locker room? Yeah, we have a we have a number of personalities in our locker room that I think contribute in different ways. Uh, you know, Mike Smith for once. You know, he, he's a tremendous athlete at the age he is, the longevity, the success he's had in this league. Um, he he has a huge impact and influence on our team, and not just with his goalie position, uh, through throughout our locker room in every position, in every everyone's personality. Um, but you mentioned Kenny, Kenny made some additions here. You know, Zach Hyman comes in um, and has been playing a tremendous you know, role for us so far this year and had great impact with our team, team success. Um, and so that's been a huge addition. Ryan Nugent Hopkins has been off to a tremendous start. He's a tremendous hockey player, uh, long, long time oiler, obviously, as everyone knows. Uh, but you bring in a guy like Duncan Keith um, that's come in and helps solidify our back end and uh, the experience, the knowledge that he's brought to our guys um, has been certainly uh, evident so far early in this season. Uh, a guy like Warren Fogel comes in, or Derek Ryan, call it in a, you know, a more supporting role, um, have been very useful for us, have, have been very effective for us. Um, and so that was, I, it was critical for our team to, to have more depth, more balance as we move forward. Um, we brought some guys that that 
really are competitive, that are hard to play against, um, that allows us to play with the puck more, which feeds into the strengths of our team. And, and certainly those two individuals, it was Leon and Connor, uh, when they have the puck, um, there's maybe no one better in the world with, uh, with doing great things and positive things with the puck. Uh, and certainly when they're together is a, is a whole another uh, <laughs> a whole another conversation. But uh, so what Kenny's done in the off season, it's, it's allowed our team to, to have better balance and to, uh, to be able to hopefully be extreme competitive in different types of games. You mentioned, uh, Mike Smith there, and then the intangible of like how much, how well liked he is amongst his teammates and sort of what role he serves in the locker room. Uh, that's often overlooked or potentially underappreciated by, by the press. Uh, I think probably because none of them have ever been in the locker room before, like to really get that. And I think that's one of the pieces that this analytics movement doesn't understand either. Um, there's no number on that. Uh, what, what do you have to say about that? Because there's, there was some criticism over the off season that like, why didn't you guys get a goalie? I mean, Mike Smith had a great year last year, but he is old. I mean, he's old for the yeah. league, you know, like one, there's obviously a trust there that he can do the job, but how, how much does it matter that everyone loves this guy and, and, and he serves as a great, as a great uh, example or whatever he, whatever you would say in the locker room. Yeah. I think there has to be a balance of all those things. Like, uh, and not just in Mike's case, but call it anybody's case of, uh, their value added, if you will. Um, it just it just can't be in a number or a statistic. And it can't just be uh, potentially just what is accomplished on the ice during their shift or during their time and then it, whatever it would be. Uh, there's more to it than that than as you know. Um, you talk about the glue guy, the culture uh, that you're trying to establish, a winning culture in, in, in this environment. Um, you need those individuals that some people may not understand the value that he adds. And uh, Mike certainly does that with this group on and off the ice. No question. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one thing that I try and uh, players of whatever age, if, if they would listen is like, there is like guys like yourself, guys like tip guys like Ken Holland. Like there's, there's a value of course, of what your hockey card says, you know, like people look at that. You, you can't deny that people look at that, but to play as long as somebody like Smith to, to, to be around like a Derek Ryan, you know, that who's, who's there and who's, who's being valuable and an asset. Like you have to have the internals, right. That make you a desirable player in that room. And in my mind, like those are skills that can be worked on as well, right? Like how to be a good teammate. What does that look like? What do you need to get better at? And you talk about self-assessment. That's one of my major themes is always like, where can you get better? You want to play this game for a long time? You're going to have to be a good teammate. People are going to want to go to bat for you, right? No question. And you, you mentioned Derek Ryan. You mentioned, you know, you could call, you know, it's Mike Smith. It's Kyle Turris on our team who's had a, a long career, successful career. Uh, there's a reason, Duncan Keith, there's a reason that these, these people or these guys uh, play a long time and play at a high level a long time. And it's just not their physical ability. Yeah. Uh, in most cases. Yeah, exactly. The physical ability is the one where everyone falls in love with, but it's those, it's those other things that I try and shine a light on a little bit is like those things matter too. Derek Ryan's story for me, he was actually a, a podcast guest and um, he was one of the, well, there's been quite a few now actually that I don't know at all, but I never met him before at all, but we, we had a connection from the Spokane Chiefs because we both played there. And I know right. the alma mater there in Michigan is kind of the same. You're part of a fraternity, right? When you, when you yeah. play somewhere, somebody else does, but are you familiar with his story of like him going to the Canadian university and then to like some no name league in the middle of Europe and like now he's an NHL or like, it's so phenomenal. It's incredible. It really is. Uh, and not the biggest guy, not the fastest guy, not the purest goal scorer, but he brings an element to teams um, that are desirable uh, for us, you know, He's a right shot centerman that digs in on face us that can kill penalties, uh, that can match up against strong opponents. Um, and so it's good to see those guys thrive and be successful. And specifically, you add in then the storyline of where he's come from at the U of A, then over to Europe for a number of years. And he was a tremendous player in Europe. Uh, and then back and getting his crack in the NHL and has had a heck of a career in the NHL. 
he's just an all around great individual yeah. and, and, you, and character matters, as you know, yeah. and he's highly, highly cared. That came through on stage too, like talking with him, right? Like just, yeah. you know, I, I guess, well, I guess I, I was going to say he kind of has to be humble, but he doesn't actually, he, he could actually be a guy that's not humble for like where he's, how he got to where he got to, you know, and now he's kind of sitting on top of the mountain in the national league um, and fought every inch of the way to get there. Um, but he is, you could, you could, I mean, it was just easy to talk to. You could tell that, uh, you know, he, he was methodical about getting better. You know, he was, he, 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 the, the, his progression was really cool to discuss. And I guess there's a storyline there too, because the, the relationship mattered for him as well, because his junior coach and Bill Peters was the guy who gave him the chance in Carolina, you know? So it's like exactly. the, the, those, those happen, those parallels happen more often than not. And he got his chance and then he earned his role. And then there he is. Um, maybe that's a good segue to talk, go back to you, YZ, with, I saw you got three games in Toronto and no one will ever take those away from you. Uh, it's a real special club. I only had 41, but Hey, we, we, we did play, right. We did right. play and, and it was pretty cool to say that we did. Uh, but you were really, really, really successful at the second best level and to only get three games, like to, to look back on that, it was, it was just bad timing. Did you not get an opportunity? I'm sure you felt like you deserved an opportunity. I think you did. Uh, like, how, how about what, what was that for you um, in your career? Yeah, it's uh, there were some frustrating moments of, of maybe, uh, you know, a couple years, three or four years into my pro career after I think I've established myself in a, in a positive way of uh doing some things in the right way for for a team the teams i were i was on um but i don't look back with regret or or anything like that um hey i, I wasn't the, the the biggest player and i wasn't the fastest player and i get it and it was a league that was that was big and they were starting to get you know faster uh rules were a little different people can say what they want um Maybe then I just wasn't good enough to be at that level and, and be really productive. Would I have liked a little more uh, opportunity? Yeah, sure. I think we all would, right? Um, but I don't look back on it and, and should have, would have, could have a whole lot. Uh, you know, did I maximize everything that I had? Maybe. I'm not sure. Could I have worked a little harder in the offseason, do some different things to improve my self-assessment, have a different self-assessment, a different approach on my game? I probably could have, no question. Um, but in the end, I, I, you know, I was happy with the way my playing career went, uh, minus the injuries, cause that, that had an effect on me. But, uh, as far as the ability, I was hope I was a good teammate. I hope I worked hard. Um, and I hope I contributed in a way to make other people around me better. And, uh, when it wasn't a, hopefully it wasn't a huge headache for many of the coaches I had maybe. No, well, considering your considering the history and where you are now, that obviously wasn't the case. But how did like how did the training camps go for you? Like, were you were you successful in camps? Like, I don't mean to dig in on this because, but this there is players go through shitty stuff. You know what I mean? Like, and and, and like, and we have to find ways to keep going even when it's maybe not what we want, right? Or maybe not what we think we deserve. Um, like, was there, was there some camps where you're like, how the hell am I not still here? Or like, wh why is X, Y, Z getting called and I'm not like, do you have any scenarios like that? Yeah. I went to a couple of camps in Toronto. Um, and, uh, one, I had a good camp, second, one, not a good camp. Didn't he, you know, at the end, I could have been the first string of cuts gone, uh, you know, for a number of reasons, but, uh, as I played certainly in the, in the year in St. John's, uh, I had a good start to the year. I, I was strong throughout the balance of the year. Uh, I got called up just before Christmas time. Um, and like I said, three games. But it's, you know, was I meant in the right frame of mind mentally to take advantage of that opportunity, whether it was in camp or whether it was when I got called up? I don't know that. Whether it's self-confidence, uh, the ability to uh, feel I belonged, the ability to uh, you know, understand, uh, the moment. Um, I probably wish I had a little bit, uh, better understanding of some of those things. Um, but it is what it is at yeah. the end of the day for me. Um, but yeah, like, so the training camp part, yeah, like I, I felt prepared going into camps. Uh, some went my way that I thought, okay, man, in, in, you know, maybe get a couple exhibition game looks, which I did. Um, but I, I thought that uh, my playing the minors would would allow me maybe some 
some different opportunities, some more opportunities, and it didn't, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, for what, and because I understand a little bit more now, encompassing of what goes through in in these walls in the discussions, and uh, but but looking back, Jace, like. I think that uh, I'm happy with the, the way the career for me went playing wise. Uh, I met tremendous pe- teammates and lifelong friendships. I'm glad we're able to reconnect. Um, and so the games provided me a whole lot, which I can't complain too much. No, about. No, for sure. Yeah, no, for sure. Same thing with me. You know what I mean, like, it, I, of course, there was stuff left on the table. I think, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think anyone maximizes for, you know, completely. Uh, I try and teach accountability, right? And 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 I really try and look at back on my career with that accountability. But there is an element of opportunity as well, right? Like, you know, is there an opportunity? Could could, could were you given the chance to um, to stake your claim? Uh, yeah. And you I mentioned, just, just to, sorry to interrupt, but just to before I lose, I reflect on my, my, my I, have a, I have two daughters, and uh, one's twenty four, graduated in, in in the workforce now, and and one's a tenth grader. And she's a field hockey player and, uh, and, and a really good field hockey player. And uh, I try to teach her this very similar things of, you know, and maybe because it's part of my looking back at my career that maybe I left a little bit on the table, the, the work ethic, the, the preparation, the, the sacrifice a few moments to, to see if I can improve in some different areas. Um, I'm just trying to make her aware of some of that stuff and the discipline that's required to be the best you can be. And, and that's part of probably what I look back on my career um, that I also tried to impose a little bit on, you know, my daughter and or certainly uh, some of the young athletes I had at Michigan uh, of, uh, of take advantage of opportunities, take advantage of resources. Um, and if you do that, you know, the path forward is is fine the path forward you'll have no regrets for and whatever that path is yeah one last break from the episode here with brian just to share uh how to work with me i know a lot of families do reach out um either on an individual basis or coaches uh, that is what I do during the season is work with teams to help them get better. I walk them through my Peak Potential Hockey Project, uh, which is an amazing team builder. Uh, if you want to get an advantage on your competition, having all of your players take the program uh, and whether the coach himself takes the players through the coaching session or whether they use me to take the players through the coaching sessions, uh, it is an invaluable tool uh, to help reach reach goals and help to win some hockey games. Uh, there's also the ability to work with me personally uh, through the Peak Performance Project on an individual basis. Uh, those projects, uh, the Peak Performance Project runs every five weeks. It's a four-week course. Uh, that runs every five weeks and it is uh, coached by me. There's a coaching call at the end of each week and uh, I get to work with players from all across North America uh, for that particular session. So you can sign up there on my website, www.upmyhockey.com. The Peak Performance Project covers the four most important mindset areas of the game that I feel are being underutilized by players. And uh, and it's administered in a way that players find really fun and interactive. Uh, it's it's only lessons Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Uh, the lessons that get made up of different uh, of various videos. They're short to the point. Uh, I never keep the content to more than 20 minutes in a day. Uh, there is a little bit of uh, action items, if you will say, that's assigned to some days in particular. Um, but yeah, I, the, the content gets released Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So when you wake up in the morning, there's new content there. Uh, it's not an arduous, overwhelming process, uh, but you are learning and you are encouraged to take action steps on the daily uh, to evolve your, your mindset and your mental game and your approach to the game. So uh, having such phenomenal success with that program that I'm uh, really, really happy to market it and to talk about it because I see the results players are getting and that the parents are seeing in the players uh, and how, how much more resilient they're becoming, how much more confident, how, how they're getting better results on the ice. And really at the end of the day, how much more empowered they feel, um, the players feel and just taking ownership of their development and of their, of their hockey dreams. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. So the peak performance, uh, peak, per, per, uh, peak potential hockey project is, uh, is really how you can work with me. And again, it's uh, contact is on my website, upmyhockey.com. Now back to the episode with Brian Wiseman. No, great point. Uh, almost like resonates 100%. It just I hear the words of Brad Larson coming out, a past guest in the podcast, and 
And that was really, you know, Lars probably as a player, yeah. uh, he, he, he can confidently say he, he did everything he could, you know, like that's just the way he, he approached it. You know, yeah. he, he, he got more than he ever thought he would get and he's proud of what he did. And uh, obviously he wears that same type of attitude as a, as a coach now, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, and prepares the same way and has his players prepare the same way, which is, which is cool to see and see the success uh, Columbus is having this year as a, as yeah. an ex uh, peewee provincial champion. Brad was on, on my, uh, on my peewee team in Vernon. There so. you go. Good. Yeah, that was good stuff. Um, when uh, you, you talked about being prepared for the moment, though, like when you were when you were there, or I mean, getting called up. But I don't know how old you were at the time, but uh, I remember, you know, my my first games was a twenty year old rookie and um, trying to manage that. You know, trying to manage everything about that. Trying to manage the NHL guys you're now in the locker room with. Trying to manage your own preparedness and your success on the ice. Trying to manage being an NHL player socially and what that means. And I mean, there's a lot that happens. You know, for for young men when when they're in that scenario. Um, I have nothing disparaging to say about anyone that was in a coaching role because no one did anything wrong. Um, but looking back now and what I'm what I'm doing, right, and maybe what you're doing. I think that maybe people could have done more to help with that transition, you know, like to help having me be comfortable or whatever. And again, no ownership on anyone else. Accountability is on me as a player back there. You had to do it. I'm not using that as an excuse at all. But um, do you find because of your own your own experience and your own history that maybe you're like taking that guy out for a cup of coffee or just I don't know. Like, do you have do you have a little different of feeling for those guys who are maybe getting called up now or young guys? It is. Who- no question. And uh, I believe there has to be, from my experience as a player and into my brief coaching career at Michigan and now here in, the, in Edmonton, um, it's critical that you develop those relationships and to have those conversations. Uh, we were just talking with uh, the other assistant coach yesterday, ironically, he was talking about his own boy and uh, hockey player. And some of the positive reinforcement and how positively that can affect going forward Um, and not BSing anybody. uh, We're not here to do that. We have to be honest and truthful of somebody's game, but to give them the pat on the back, to give them the voice of confidence, uh, to instill some of that confidence that they can then grab a hold of and build and, and magnify themselves, uh, I think is ultimately critical that you see coaches do much more of now than maybe previously. Um, not that they cared any less than than now. It was just a different approach as we can all uh, understand and appreciate. Uh, I think uh, now you see more coaches having those conversations, those moments, uh, those touch points, we'll call it, with these individuals uh, to hopefully make some positive impact and instill, you know, some good vibes and confidence moving forward Uh, because it is daunting getting called up for your first time in the NHL or at a training camp, your first NHL training camp uh, when the nerves are going and the anxieties up high or whatever that the stresses you may be dealing with. uh, Can we calm those a little bit um, as part of our role? Yeah, I know that's a great answer. I, uh, it's, yeah, I mean that comfortability, right? I mean, you talked about being positive too. Like I, I, I use the term "catch them when they're good." Like it, it's, it's really easy to to see the mistakes and want to correct the mistakes or you know the 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 the, the inefficiencies. Um, and I think that was kind of more in our time too. But I, I do, I see it. Like in, I mean, I coach, I head coach younger athletes right and I, and I totally see that difference at that level of like catch them with their good like the positive reinforcement can be such a great coaching moment for everybody as well right like look what yeah. just happened there that was awesome like that's what we want to have happen and of course the terminology used with with the, some of these pros at, at your level would be different but um, I think it's just as effective right if you're constantly showing mistakes and the video is about mistakes and how we made mistakes like you got to show some positive stuff too. And I, and I find that a lot of teams are starting to do more of that. It is. And it's incredible that you mentioned that because uh, it's so important, you know, yeah, we, we need to point out some, some areas of improvement within the individual or team game, but we self, certainly have to recognize uh, those positive things that are going on in the individual or our team's game. Uh, our, my coach, you know, at Michigan, Red Berenson, who I 
played for, for four years and I coached with for six. A tremendous, a tremendous individual, brilliant coach. Um, would always talk about when I went back to coaching with him. But, you know, hey, grab so-and-so and, -so and uh, look back at last week's and, and sh let's show him, you know, six, eight, ten really good clips, you know, when he's maybe he's not feeling it. Or we have a goal scorer that's that's struggling. He's maybe gripping it and he's just fighting it a little bit. Hey, let's pull up his last ten goals he scored. Let's let's show him some of those. Or maybe we got a big series against the same team and he scored four last year. Let's 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 bring him in and show him if it's kind of goes in line with what we think he needs to do. Um, it's powerful. It, it certainly is, and I think it's 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 great that people are recognizing yourself and others uh, that the impact that that those conversations. Uh, those moments can have in, in one's confidence. And this kind of brings us back to the original thing of confidence building. And uh, there's lots of tools out there, uh, but how to build one's confidence is is part of our responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes sometimes guys can get a bit high and get complacent and sometimes yeah. they're too low and they need to pat in the back. And you're always managing that roller coaster for sure. Uh, right. We'll finish off here, YZ. I, I, we're rolling up on an hour. If, if you don't mind, I got a I got a parent group on Facebook from all across North America, 1500 families. And uh, sometimes before yeah. I interview a guest, I'll, I'll just ask, you know, who I'm to say who I'm speaking with, if anyone has any questions. And there was, Perfect. There was uh, two or three good ones here. So if you don't mind, we'll just ask some some questions from the parents. Um, they'll get to hear it on the podcast. So the uh, first one's from Dan Kaufman. He says, how does the Oilers coaching staff divide, share the workload of their team? I'm curious how the teams in the NHL parcel out the jobs and what those jobs are. That's, that's a good, a good so question. Great question. Um, it's so our head coach kind of oversees everything that's going on. Um, we have three assistant coaches, a goalie coach, a video coach. We have a big staff. Um, so one of our assistant coaches takes care of the penalty kill, like a focus on our penalty kill and defense. One would have a focus on power play in our forward group. Uh, myself, I have a focus on face offs. And primarily the forward group and some of the younger guys that are coming up through the ranks um, would be probably an area of focus for me that I was brought in to do and in, in, in some different things. We have our goalie guy, our video guys in charge of, you know, make sure all of the managing of the video and pre-scouts and everything's in line for our coach and staff. Um, and our head coach kind of oversees it all and really monitors our five on five play um, and dives into statistic stuff, analytic stuff that, that I've dabbled into here as well. Um, we have a very unique staff here in Edmonton, Jason. Um, and I, I've only been on a few and, and I don't have this long history of coaching. Um, but I would hesitate to say there's many, there's not many more staffs out there that are more connected in respect and uh, great respect for one another than what our group is. And not saying there's bad ones out there by any means. Um, we have a very connected staff and it starts with our leader, Dave Tippett. Um, and, and you can mention Ken Holland in that breath of who put the staff together or helped comprise the staff. Um, again, we have our responsibilities. We all respect others input. We have diff multiple eyes on different things that are going on in the game. And I'll go to the, you know, to our assistant coach and ask him about, Hey, you seen anything on face us that maybe I'm overlooking. I'm not seeing it. And he'll do the same thing on power player. PK does very similar things. So, our head coach oversees everything. Um, obviously, he dives into lots of our individual uh, individual play and or our te overall team play. But um, it, there's there's many duties out there in to make this thing work. And uh, and our coach delegates it and he allows us to allows us to do our job, um, uh, which is great. That's cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll have one follow up on that. I know uh, again, 20 years ago, that the head coach was in most in most scenarios relatively unapproachable maybe be the right word you could but you probably weren't going through his door very often there wasn't too many you know like i'm going to initiate this meeting of course they would talk to you and they wanted to uh but the assistant coaches were the guys that were playing cards at the back of the bus and you know kind of working on stuff with, with, with the players and and were more of that liaison maybe to the head coach is, is that still kind of the traditional role or are you are you kind of more of the getting to know the players a little bit and and, and trying to build those relationships yeah, still, still in that process of building relationships with, with players, understanding what they need, understanding uh, player A to player B, what their their different needs might be or their personalities. Um, our head coach here, I, I always said that Tip is a, was ahead of his time. 
he was quote unquote back in the day, the players coach, whatever that term means to people. Um, but what you said, he was approachable. He, it wasn't always a one way you had to go see him. He was seeking out you for just conversation. How you doing? What's going on away from the rink? Different things to married guys with families, with the single guys with not. Um, that was back in 1996, 97, 98, 99 when I was with him. In those years, um, as the head coach, you didn't probably, that wasn't necessarily the norm uh, for the head coach's role. Uh, but it's certainly appreciated because I certainly appreciate it as a, as a young player back there that my coach um, developed a relationship or wanted to develop a relationship. Um, and then there was a sense of, yeah, he, he has my best interests at heart. He wants me to be the best I can be. I understand that. And uh, little did I know, I, I, we had a lot of guys that went and played hard, really hard for him. Yeah. Well, it humanizes them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't know what else to, what word to put on it, right? I mean, there, it's just a human that seems like he has a genuine interest in another human instead of just being a player, you know, like with, I don't know. I think that to me, that's the next greatest evolution. And I think it's kind of happening before our eyes right now, but that, that focus on, on the person behind the player, you know, that person behind the player, because there's things that make that person tick. There's things that he cares about. There's things that are going to, you know, the more you know about them and the more you genuinely care about them as, as a person and not just an asset on the power play, I think you're going to get more out of that guy. 100%. Uh, it's a relationship driven process that these guys just happen to be hockey players. And a, and a former coach said that uh, much more eloquently than I did. Uh, Todd McClellan, when I was out of camp at his, is hey, we're in the relationship business and uh, getting to know these individuals to make sure that they care and we, there's a mutual trust. Uh, they just happen to play hockey. Yeah, cool. No, I love it. Um, Paul Parkinson asks, uh, I would ask him if he's concerned about where they place in the standings or if their focus is a deep playoff run. <clears throat> also, how do you maintain focus through an 82 game schedule? Good question. Um, we certainly are mindful uh, of the standings per se, because obviously there's thresholds throughout the season that, that, uh, that is an indicator of, of where we stack up against others. Um, obviously we know, you know, how many teams make the playoffs. So there's a standings part, but our focus really here, and it comes from our coach is, and, and you'll hear lots of coaches. It's, it's just, how are we playing? Like, where is our game at? Are, are we maximizing now, right now, as best we can? Now, that may not, our, our maximum might not be the same now as it's going to be in January as it will be in March. But as the team is comprised right now of what we're going through, schedule, different things, um, are we maximizing? Are we playing the best to our ability? Um, if the answer is yes, we just keep moving along. And with that, you hopefully through that process that you're getting the results that you want to. Uh, but certainly mindful of this, the standings. Um, and we do talk about early now um, of playoff style hockey because our goal is to make a long run in the Stanley Cup playoffs um, and hopefully to achieve the ultimate. And so we're mindful of that. We talk about it. Um, but more it's about the day-to-day -day play and approach that builds to that time in, in the springtime. If that the makes building sense. is the key word. And, and that is one that I'm not eloquent in speaking about. Cause as a player, you, I don't feel like I ever like held something back per se, you know, thinking, well, I'm going to need this in March or April. I know as a coaching staff, it's, it's tough to put the reins on anybody. Cause really you don't want to, right. I mean, you want everyone, like you say, playing their best and you, you want your team to be successful, but you do want to build, right? I mean, you want to be playing your best hockey at the right time of year and you need to have stuff in the tank and there needs to be somewhere else to go, get to get to, right? Because yeah. you, if you don't make that step, you're getting left behind. And how do you, like, is, is that something that is talked about or how do you even navigate that? Yeah, it, it, but you're right. Like, I think it just comes probably organically or naturally a little bit, you know, uh, through the processes we all go through. We talk about like habits, um, you know, playoff winning habits um, at critical times of the games, um, situation scoreboard dictating some different things for us, right? Um, 
that, yeah, you might be able to get away with it now, you know, but when things get a little tighter in the second half and the playoff push, um, when things get really hard, much harder in the playoffs, those things matter. Yeah. Um, those moments, those details, those situations uh, could have a, certainly a much more negative in fact, impact than it does now in November, in December. Um, so that's kind of our approach, how right. we build oh, those, I love those things. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I'm smiling on the inside. Well, now I'm going to announce it on the outside. But like I've had those like that same theme, that same conversation with my U13 team. Like we had a good team. We had a really good team. And oftentimes we're we're up by quite a few goals. And it's easy in the last five minutes to maybe be careless or to do things, not really recognize the game or to get like the habits you're talking about or the standards is another word that I use. Like yeah. what's our standard? Like what's our team standard here? And, uh, and to talk about the good habits, because when it does matter, right, when it really matters and when it's on the line, you can't be, oh, I should do it now, right? Like it doesn't work that way. You got to just have it ingrained in you. This is the way you do it. That's so right. um, to hear you say that at the NHL level, uh, I'm going to play this clip from my team and, and just let them know that, <laughs> hey, um, you know, we're, we're all trying to do it. And it actually makes sense. So maybe we should maybe we should believe in it. So thanks, for, thanks for answering that. That's good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> I got the last one here. Um, Taylor Wilson says, what would he say the key contributor for number 29 and number 97's progression on reaching the top one or two players in the league? Mindset, work ethic, off-ice combination, or all of it? Um, and that's the question from Taylor Wilson. Yeah, Taylor, um, I don't know if there's one specific answer to that. It would probably be a lot of what you put out there, all of it. Work ethic, mindset, commitment. Uh, they're highly motivated individuals, number one. Uh, they want to be the best. Um they're team guys they're you know that that want to win um, and do what it takes to win and uh they're ever evolving uh their game uh on and off the ice uh how they can impact others and understanding they're maturing and not in a negative way like they're immature they're maturing as they go on they're 24 25 years old they're maturing their game's maturing um their impact within our locker room uh, is developing over the short time that I've been here. Um, it's impressive to see. And, uh, you know, we go back to um, Leon was the Hart Trophy winner a year ago and Connor two years ago, um, or vice versa, I guess it was, right? Um, they're very motivated individuals. I talked about intrinsic Com competitors they are but tremendous respect for one another um in in respect for what the other individual do does amongst uh, our team and the contributions they make and so uh as you know uh most teams winning teams uh they have a combination of some pretty good hockey players and we're fortunate to have two of the best here yeah yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not a part of the Oilers news feed on, on a regular basis, but but from what I do get out of Edmonton and how they cover, like how the press covers McDavid and, and Dreisaitl, I, I don't feel, well, one, I mean, Dreisaitl was fourth overall. McDavid was supposed to be like the next coming of Christ, right? You I mean, like that's everyone thought that he was going to do that and he's fulfilled that role. Dreisaitl wasn't as heralded, obviously a very highly skilled player to go fourth overall. But I don't think anyone expected him to be winning hard trophies and, and you know, 20 goals and 20 games type of guy. So I think his evolution is really interesting. Um, but I, what I wanted to talk about or maybe ask you about is that dynamic, because we're talking about world class competitors who, yes, they want to win, but they also want to be the best. Yet they're on the same team. You know what I mean? Like that, that could be really cancerous. I mean, it could be, but it seems like it's not. So like, how is that relationship with them and yeah. how do they go about their business having the relationship and being so good at what they do? Yeah. I believe they, it starts with respect for one another, what, other, what one another brings to the table, right? Uh, they have a great relationship from my, all my understanding uh, with each other away from the ranked friends hang out. Um, but they enjoy each other. They get motivated and competitive against each other. You see it in practice and in games. Um, you put the two together on a line and it's, it's, it's nice to see some of the stuff that they do together. Um, it, it, it's, they're, they're special, they're special hockey players, but they're special people. And, uh, 
And I'm fortunate that I'm a part of this learning from them 100% and learning a ton from those guys as much as well as others on our team. Uh, but to be able to see this day in day out with these two um, is pretty unique perspective. And it's, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm certainly fortunate. Yeah, super special. I mean, really to be able to, to go in every day and be around two of the best in the world is cool. And, and yeah, talk about chemistry. You talked about all in yourself and I mean, you do, you can elevate, players can elevate each other, of course, right? You, you get more, some players get more of each other and, and, uh, and just Connor's game compared to Leon's just seems so complimentary, right? Leon slows it down. He's pr- pr- slow, ducks a pr- big body, uh, sees the ice so well. Connor's so fast and, and dynamic. Like it, I could imagine trying to match up uh, playing against you guys. That would be that'd be super hard. So it's a good problem for you guys. Uh, well, it's not a problem for you guys. It's a great uh, advantage for you guys to have. And now See you have those is. other pieces in place. And, um, you know, you mentioned earlier. I mean, I think the it seems like the culture's there. You talked about what you feel in the coaching room there. I know I know Ken Holland from my experience with the Red Wings, my brief experience with the Red Wings and from him personally, but like that that feeling in Detroit when I was there was unlike any other NHL organization that I went to. Of course they were good, but the people that were there um, were good people, you know, from, from top to bottom. And it started with Ken. He was approachable. He's a human. You talk about ego. There's no ego there. He just wants to do a good job. Um, you know, it sounds like tips the exact same way. Now he's brought in someone like him and you have these, uh, these two obviously huge pieces of the puzzle and Connor and Leon and all these other supporting pieces that, uh, it just really looks like there's something special happening there. And as we all know, there's a lot of special things happening in other places in the league too. So it's a hard trophy to win, but, um, you know, you guys are well on your way and I think you guys are growing and, and, uh, what a great spot to be in. It certainly is. And it's, it's, it's been a great experience for me for the last two and a half years. Fortunate. Uh, the tip brought me along and to be around this group of coaches and these group of play- this group of players has been uh, has been tremendous. Yeah, no Edmonton, Edmonton enjoys a good long playoff run there. They're due for a while. Right. So uh, we fun to see some good Canadian teams, boy, this year too. Capitals looking good as well. It's uh, It should be a fun playoff. So, uh, Wisey, we're just over an hour. Um, I apologize for going over the hour, but it no just seems to happen. We can kind of start chatting all day. But I know you're a busy man. Your phone's ringing there, so we'll cut her short. Um much gratitude. Thank you so much for, for coming out. And I really appreciate the conversation. No, thanks for having me. Thanks for reaching out, Jay. And it's, uh, it was good to see you and reconnect after all these years. Stay in touch. Definitely, for sure. Well, thank you so much for sticking around to the end. That was a fantastic conversation. I really enjoyed reconnecting with Brian. Brian, if you're listening, thank you so much for spending your time. Uh, I know how busy these hockey uh, people are. It really, they're at the rink all the time and there's always something to do. So for Brian to take an hour out of his day to, to share some of his knowledge and experience with us, um, much gratitude, uh, very appreciated. And I know there was a lot of stuff in there. Uh, love hearing about Connor's commitment. Um, we always just automatically assume that when we see a person of that level, of that status, in whatever they do, um, Connor obviously being the best hockey player in the world at this moment in time, uh, we just think that they're they're better. We just think that they're they have a higher level of skill than anyone else, and that's why they're there. Now, in Connor's case, you know, some of that is probably true. You know, I mean, he was heralded from a young age that he was going to be the next best thing, and uh, and he's living up to the, those expectations. But the thing about being the best is that whenever you talk about somebody or you hear about uh, someone that is at the top level of their game, they have world class standards as well and world class commitment to their craft and a lot of us don't line up that way you know when things when we get good at something we take our foot off the gas we don't keep continually trying to find ways to get better we don't continually push we don't continually strive um, so for someone uh, to listen to someone like Connor that not only is he ultimately skilled and he's an elite performer but he's also tenacious at his development He's curious about how to get better. He's willing to invest in himself to improve at a status when a lot of people just wouldn't even know they have room to improve. He's the best player in the world, yet he's trying to get better. So if there's one lesson you can take away from this podcast, it's like, what are you doing today? What have you done today as a player to step into that goal or to step into that dream that you may have? You know, you might not be getting the ice time you want right now. You might not be where you want to be. Uh, The easiest question to answer is, am I getting better? Am I getting better? 
Am I deserving that power play time? What am I doing in my spare time to get on the line I want to be on or to play on the, to, uh, play on the team I want to be on? And obviously Connor's an example of that. If he can be working on his uh, face-offs in the off-season, uh, and if he can be working on his one-timer in the off-season to try and just incrementally increase facets of his game that are going to allow him an opportunity to really cement his status as one of the best players of all time and to also help his team win hockey games, I think, I think that all of you out there listening can probably step up your game uh, and become more accountable to your development. So be curious, be focused, be passionate. This game is amazing that we have the opportunity to, to, uh, to play and, uh, and, tr and make the most of it. Leave it all out on the ice. And that means that you're aligning with your thoughts, with your habits, uh, with your goals. And when we do that, we're doing things right. So as always, thanks for listening. Play hard. Keep your head up.